two. Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We're uh, positively at Lexington Market. We're at Fadley's. Don Moeller is here. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're going to get to Baltimore Positive. We've had some impeachment stuff. We've had crazy stuff, but it's great to have a congressman here. Thanks for coming down, having yeah, a crab cake with us here. Uh, here at Lexington Market. And off we go here, Don Moeller. Con congressman John Sarbanes. We also want to uh, thank our sponsors at Jennings and State Fair and, and Fadley's. Uh, Congressman, I don't know if you're familiar with the group. We interviewed a couple weeks ago Sarah Heminger from a group called Thread. Oh, yeah, I know Sarah very well. Just doing incredible am work. Amazing work. And we're, we're asking every week, we're saying to people, please go to Thread's website. Go to thread.org. Yeah. They're making a difference. No, learning about what they're doing is it's in inspirational. I've had a chance to talk with her over the years and then kind of watch from a distance the progress they made. It's, it's they bring a whole team to bear on these kids' lives, it makes all the difference in the world. Well, it, it's, yeah. a, it's amazing that when we talked with Sarah, that now after 15 years, there are up over 500 young yeah. men and women. It's amazing. Every one of them has been successful, and none have left the program. So we're, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, it's not surprising that you know Sarah. We, 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 we joke with one another. The good we people haven't met all anyone. know each other. You we know haven't, we yeah. haven't met anyone yet yeah, that doesn't sure. know her and the good work <laughs> yeah. she's doing. Well, Anything going on in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Let me just say about where we are. I was telling you a moment ago. So um, my brother-in-law, who lives in Houston, he visits maybe, you know, three, four times a year here. <coughs> Before he even comes to our house to stay, he comes here. To get his crab cake. Absolutely. <laughs> got to get his Well, fixed. you know, we're... <laughs> All the way from Houston. <laughs> it, it is an amazing scene we're here day after day. But, you know, we started Baltimore Positive uh, a year ago as a concept. Uh, Don was finishing up his time as county executive. And just thoughts about Baltimore. No one's more Baltimore than you, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the I roots of being here and your father. And you were sort of bred to do this. And you're in a life of doing this. But all of it has been to make Baltimore better, make Maryland better, make our area better. No question. I love the city. Um, the city has a vibrancy. It, it, it's got a heart to it um, that I think makes it exceptional. And, you know, we're biased because we're from right. here. Made you late today because <laughs> of traffic. So, you know, we, yeah, we have some traffic people are moving around. around. Exactly. That's good, though. Um, but do you think about all the different communities, the neighborhoods here, that Baltimore pride runs deep. You know, we feel it from top to bottom. And I think that's why this city's going to rise up. I mean, it's going to be um, I love that. a powerful center to Maryland and to this region. It has been traditionally, um, and it will continue to be. And the people here know that. Um, you know, I got, I got places like Fort McHenry in the 3rd District. Incredible resource, national treasure, history, uh, environment, habitat. It's got it all there. What a source of pride, you know, where the Star Spangled Banner was written. And we just ce celebrated Defenders Day the other day. And you remember the role that Baltimore played uh, in the War of 1812, beating back the British again. Um, and that's like, that's going back 200 years for that source of pride. But we keep it going every single day. So, um, and, and places like this are part of it. The fact that, it, that my, my brother-in-law comes from Houston, and remember, they got golf crabs down there, so it's saying something that he comes here. Right, he could get the same thing there, right? here, but not the same exactly. thing. We, we've got the owner, Damie Hahn, just smiling away yeah. over there. She loves the Houston. So <laughs> this is an example of Baltimore institutions that make us proud of this city. What do you think, Congressman? It's interesting, when we, and uh, Nestor starts with Baltimore and what it can be. What do you think needs to happen to get everybody together, because the three of us and the others we have, one, we all believe in this city. We believe. I live at the Inner Harbor. I've lived <coughs> in Inner Harbor for yeah, two decades. Yeah. We know what it can be. We know what it's been, what it can be. We know it has challenges. What do we need to do to get everyone on the same page? I think the key thing is, is to build trust across communities, between communities and political leadership, between communities and uh, law enforcement, you know, we've had troubles over the last few years. We know there's a lot of tensions there. But f the fact of the matter is it, where, th where there's tension, it shows people care. They may have different ideas about how we kind of get to the, the goal of making the city strong. But the fact that they care is a starting point. And I think establishing that trust, building trust um, among all of the different sectors here and all the different communities that exist 
is critical to that, and I think it's possible to do. Um, but we need some sort of continuity of some of those key leadership uh, positions to make that happen. I think we can get that. Um, and then I think you'll see um, a lot of the kind of pent-up energy and engagement that's out there begin to be released and to benefit the city as we go forward. So Baltimore's always been a place where, you know, it's person to person, it's neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, we have some places that are doing incredibly well. We have other places that are kind of stuck. And making sure we create opportunity in neighborhoods that may have been cut off, you know, from jobs or transportation or from, from some of the better education opportunities. If we can connect them to the parts of Baltimore that are on the rise every single day, then the whole city goes up. And I think that's the challenge, making those connections, building those connections for well, sure. It, it wasn't necessarily one of the topics we we're going to look in at today, but when I hear you talk, I, I, I think about this, and that is hearing you talk reminds me again that the red line was a major loss. Huge loss. For this region. I mean, you all had fought hard. You had the federal funding. It was in ready place. to go. It was all ready to go. The red line was going to connect. You know, the east side and the west side. How many you, years you of work for you? I mean, literally, I mean, just an incredible yeah, our whole amount delegation, of energy. Our whole this. delegation worked on making sure that that was a priority to get that federal partnership money. It was in place, and, and it was years. It was in place, and then boom, the boom drops, oh. and it doesn't happen. And I'll, I'll never, frankly, understand why the governor made that decision. And I'll tell you something else. Um, that was right after the Freddie Gray uh, protests had happened. And the city was, you know, there was a lot of turmoil here. And if we had gone forward with the red line, it would have sent this message of we're leaning in for Baltimore, right? We see the future of Baltimore. We want to connect Baltimore. So it would have been a huge shot in the arm at a very critical moment for the city. Unfortunately, governor went, went the other way on that. You had so many projects, because I used to get briefings on this, on the east side and the west side that were ready to go. Transit-oriented development, all these things that would have neighborhoods, represented neighborhoods. huge economic opportunity right? for neighborhoods that have been cut out of Baltimore's sort of emerging strength. And the red line would have done that. Can we get back to that? Well, I hope someday we can. You know, in the meantime, we've got to come up with some workarounds um, because that project got pulled off, you know, the front burner. Uh, but it's an example of how if you're creative in your thinking and you put together the right kind of political leadership, you can get something teed up. The problem is we just didn't get it done in Did, the end. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I, like I say, I don't quite understand what the governor was thinking. Well, when he because the, plug the part on you allude to and Nestor and I talk about this, people think of it as improving transportation, helping people as, as, as our friend Kevin Kamenis used to say, trying to get the choice rider yeah. on mass transportation, trying to get people from point A to point B without using a car. But you zeroed in on the other piece of the red line, which was the economic development and jobs all along that line mm -hmm. that was going, we're, we're going to build out for blocks. Absolutely. And... It's both the real impact of that economic opportunity, but also psychologically, this idea that you are, you're investing in our city, that you want to lift up those communities, that makes a huge difference. Now, I think we can find other projects that do that kind of thing, and that's where you want sort of the political leadership, the business leadership of the city, the community leaders to step forward. Actually, Dan Rodericks had a great piece today in the paper. I don't know if you saw it about the Southwest Partnership. Right. I did. We're actually we're having, we're having, having Mike, Mike on. Yeah. on. Okay. So Mike is incredible. You know, this is like his ninth incarnation as a community <laughs> leader. Right. Um, but what he's pulling together is tapping into that Baltimore spirit that says, you know, you can't keep us down. And if you get all the people who feel that way about the city, you connect them, you put some resources behind it, um, the city's going to go up. Uh, we, we all agree that change is <laughs> sort of necessary, right, until change comes, right? Like yeah. the red line would have been a change. We say we keep doing the same thing, the same thing. We need to change something. Uh, getting people to accept that part of it 
has gotten it stuck to where it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when change is proposed, that that's what feels. It feels like nothing changes because the side where we are. I don't need to tell you every day where you are, no. but just on a local level, yeah. that ch- there there needs to be a massive change, and that needs to be welcomed. And maybe that's where we are now. Maybe people are ready to do something different than what we've done. Well, you got to you got to change to to sort of keep up with the pace of the world sure things but people but but change can be hard it can be disruptive but if you have a good plan if you have a strategy for it then i think people will accept it and um that's why the the red line thing was disappointing because we did have a, a real plan for that and then we just couldn't we get had that a timeline we had it was a, done it was a real shovel ready project right and you think about all of the time and money and resources and attention and focus that went into that project. Now, like I said, I think we can assemble that same combination of energy focus and planning on a lot of other good things for the city. Look at what's happening around uh, the train station. Another example of some real good master planning about what you do with a really important part of Baltimore City. And that's coming together in a very positive way way so that's just one example of something you can keep your eyes on so that's the challenge for Baltimore but you know we still have all these young people flocking in here um, it's a very appealing city they kind of like the grid of Baltimore and um, it's very bohemian in yes. a sense now know, the, yeah. our challenge is we got to keep them once they come right you know, and they get a little older and they start having kids and they need to go to school and that kind of well, That's where we got to hold on right? to they, they have to have right. ownership yeah. of the city. Exactly. Because we, we've always been provincial enough mm-hmm. to look at somebody from out of town as saying they're from out of town, right? I mean, I think we're more welcoming about look, they that. they go to a couple of crab feasts and they become automatic. Well, the they're fact Baltimore. that they, right. they right. want to be here. Baltimore. We accept them. We'll give them their badge right, right. at that point. Well, <laughs> the fact that they chose to come here and they want to be here, yeah. right? And, For and, sure. And, and, and we talk about this all the time. Crime, uh, yeah, I live at the heart. <clears throat> crime is the number one issue among citizens in the city. Yeah. Uh, aside from everything that's going on with the president and everything you guys are fighting for. And, but, but, but crime in, 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 in our city specifically, especially after Freddie Gray, it's just something that's a daily part of... Of, of my wife and I's life walking yeah. around downtown. And that's where it's important to build that trust and that partnership between the communities and the police department. Um, this new, we have a new commissioner, as right. you know, uh, Michael Harrison, and um, initial impressions. Um, I think he's got his fingers on the pulse of what the city needs. He understands how consent decrees work because he's handled that in his previous job. And I think he's going to, he is putting together and has, has put on paper and is beginning to implement a pretty comprehensive plan about how you kind of upgrade the way the police department works and responds to the needs and concerns of the community and is in partnership with the community. Now, the challenge for us always is, you know, we get some good people, but then maybe we can't sustain it. <laughs> so, um, I hope he stays on the job for, you know, a meaningful period of time here and um, can bring the sort of reforms to the police department that the community is looking for, all the while making sure that our police and our law enforcement have the respect of the community because that's important too. I mean, it's an incredibly difficult job to be a police officer in Baltimore City. A lot of things coming at you, a lot of things to juggle. But building that that uh, partnership with the community is absolutely critical. And I think he understands that. It's part of the way he operates, his kind of view of the world, that that's what you got to do. Um, so I'm hopeful. But look, the other part of, of um, uh, dealing with crime, particularly petty crime, is just having... Um, a lot of people on the street, you know, having those numbers of folks. And that's where getting people to come in here to, um, you know, occupy these new apartments and condos that are going up and just have that sense of activity on the street every day creates a sense, a more, more of a sense of kind of safety and togetherness. So that's important, too. So it all goes together, obviously. Um, together and, and a lot of it is whether your your storyline your narrative of the city 
um, is in a kind of downward spiral or whether you can start to flip that and, and move it up. And I think it's actually easier than sometimes it feels to get that kind of positive reinforcement storyline going for a place like Baltimore. But I think we can do it. Places like this help with that. Um, and other communities like what's happening in Southwest and, and other places around the city help to support a storyline that says Baltimore's on the rise, Baltimore's on the move. <clears throat> and we have, we, we have a number of, of county executives, I think, and it's so important whether you're talking about County Executive Shevsky in Baltimore County, County Executive Ball uh, in, in, in Howard County, uh, uh, all around the region now. Uh, County Executive Pittman and Anne Arundel, uh, I believe C County Executive Glassman. I think they understand that you can't wall the city off from the suburbs. That's not a realistic approach. Well, State look, goes as Baltimore <coughs> goes, right? The, I mean, the, no question. The the third district, which I represent, you know, it's got parts of Baltimore in it. It's got parts of Baltimore we're County. We're going to talk about your district. Howard <laughs> County, Anne Arundel <laughs> County. So um, I know a lot of these neighborhoods where – there's this kind of, you know, relationship between the city and what surrounds it. Obviously, Baltimore County right. is the surrounding county. And um, there's no question that the, these other jurisdictions have a huge stake in the success of Baltimore. They're Do you inextricably think the tied together. That well enough. I mean, that, that, that when I hear someone from Bel Air or Westminster or Hereford say to me, "I'm never going back to the city because I what I saw on Fox 40, 45," I, I, I think to myself that, that that's unsustainable. That that is a perception and a reality that has to change. So there's two things. There's whether you perceive whether or not you are going to go into the city yourself. Whether you perceive that the the health and vibrancy of Baltimore City is a factor in other places or not. And I think most people appreciate that, that a strong, vibrant Baltimore City is good for the state of Maryland, whether or not they come in. Whether well, they want to participate right, or not. Right? Then the next challenge, though, is to get people to realize, hey, let's make Baltimore part of my daily life. You know, there, there's incredible assets down there, cultural institutions, the, the Inner Harbor, Fort McHenry. I mean... There's so much to offer here. Incredible um, health care. Yeah. So I think that I think that people who don't live in the city um, can be engaged in this idea of I benefit personally and directly from what Baltimore has to offer. And there's no question that some of these political leaders that you mentioned um, around around Baltimore, they get it. They're stepping up. They're trying to be real partners for the city um, because it's the right thing to do for Maryland, um, but also because they can see the impact it will have on their own jurisdiction right. if Baltimore is not strong. Correct. So they want to keep it strong. Correct. That's true. I think that's a good spot to, to take a break. When we come back, we want to talk about how little John Sarbanes became Congressman Do John Sarbanes. Crab, crab we'll after that? Hopefully that. I <laughs> and I think we're going to have to talk about... dangling the, the crab cake in front of <laughs> me. Smell here. it. We, 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 when you come in here, you smell it. We're going to have to talk about the I word in the second segment right. as well. Uh, Congressman John Sarbanes joining us. We are at Fadley's. We're at Lexington Market doing our Baltimore Positive Thank Don Muller. We're back for more on WNST AM 1570 and WNST Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore Positive. <laughs> 